Out-of-bounds blocks can be simply divided into two sections. Blocking a skater who's already out-of-bounds, and an out-of-bounds skater blocking order to get back in-bounds. Bank track derby is pretty easy. You have a rail on the outside, and a pretty sizable lip between the track and the floor underneath. I would imagine that's why we don't see a lot of apex jumps on bank track. If you miss it, say goodbye to your ankle. On the more common flat track, your only reminder is the rope, so there's a whole lot more going on out of bounds. This module is going to cover primarily out of bounds blocks and skating out of bounds. Even though cutting the track also involves a skater being out of bounds and re-entering, that's a large enough subject to leave on its own. This presentation is not the official word from the WFTDA or MRDA. I am a level 4 referee with the WFTDA, but I am not working for them and this has no official approval from them. I'm just a guy who wants to help out. And like anything that doesn't come with a WFTDA or MRDA seal of approval, take with an appropriate level of salt. In an effort to keep this presentation as correct as possible, I'm including the date that this presentation was recorded. In the event that I need to update the presentation due to something that was clarified or just out and out wrong, this date will change and there will be an update in the change log that's listed with the presentation on refed.com. The date of this recording is January 8, 2018, and no changes have been made since the original presentation was recorded. Let's start with a few basics some of which get overlooked. First, a skater is considered inbounds when their skates are fully inbounds and the body is upright. For most purposes, a down skater is the same as an out of bounds skater, as they should both not be a target, nor should they be blocking. For purposes of this module, assume that the skaters are all upright unless told otherwise. Out of bounds is having the skates fully touching out of bounds. Straddling is both, with a portion of the skates touching out of bounds and a portion of the skates touching in bounds. The boundary line is considered in bounds. The easy way to picture straddling is one skate fully out of bounds and one skate fully in bounds. But just remember that any portion out of bounds is enough to have the skater considered to be straddling. Don't get hung up on that visualization. Another reason not to get hung up on that visualization is because most people, when they're actively skating, meaning not coasting, do so one foot at a time. So if someone is exactly in the middle of the boundary line, they could very easily be going fully inbounds, fully outbounds, fully inbounds, fully outbounds, and repeat depending on what skate's hitting the floor. Being in or out of bounds is determined by whatever skates are touching. If only one skate is touching, that's the only one that matters. Now, back to straddling. Straddling is kind of like the skater who's doing it, the in-between stage of inbounds and out of bounds. For all practical purposes, they are considered out of bounds. They have no position and are not part of the pack or engagement zone. They can't block anyone, and they can't assist anyone. What they can do is be blocked. If someone is straddling, they're a potential blocking target for the opposition, and that's it. That skater isn't even allowed to counter block. Let's also cover a bit about impact. We'll get a little more involved when we talk examples, but when talking about out-of-bounds blocking, we are dealing with at least one person who doesn't have position on the track. So the classic idea of relative position isn't something we can take into account. Something the casebook has listed in a few examples is the idea of places where skaters should and shouldn't have to expect to be blocked. The most basic area where skaters should expect that they're a target for being blocked is the engagement zone, the 20 feet in either direction beyond the pack. Jammers can engage other jammers in any area of the track, but jammers shouldn't have to expect a blocker if they're 60 feet away from the engagement zone. The other areas where skaters shouldn't expect blocks are, as you might have guessed it from the title of this program, is while they're out of bounds. Likewise, skaters in bounds shouldn't have to prepare 
from opponents forcing their way in from out of bounds. That both happen is why there are penalties, but are dependent much more on the reasoning of the referee and, dare I say it, common sense. So let's start with the actual out of bounds blocks. First, with a skater in bounds who then blocks a skater fully out of bounds. Generally speaking, that's bad and that's penalizable. You might be able to find some leeway if the out of bounds skater just went out of bounds and there was no way for the opponent to not hit that now out of bounds skater. Some leeway. I'd also look for attempts to avoid that block as well. But for general discussion purposes, not blocking a skater already out of bounds should be pretty darn easy. Now, if the target skater was straddling, then the block is legal. But if that skater just before goes out of bounds, then I'm likely to give the initiating blocker some slack. The longer that target skater is out of bounds, however, the less leeway I'm going to give. It's been a long time since I played derby myself, but let's think about what a skater who's out of bounds, either coming from the penalty box or just recovering from a block, is thinking. If there's no immediate return to play, then the main thought is where to return to play. Where is the legal reentry point and what's my strategy once I'm on the track? At this stage, the skater is less likely to be in a derby stance and instead more upright to get a better look at the breadth of the game. Once that opening and strategy is determined, the skater returns to their particular derby stance and re-enters the track. During that upright phase, they are far more vulnerable to big hits and much more susceptible to injury. Part of this is because short of skaters flying in off legal hits, this is roller derby after all, there's little expectation of a deliberate block against the person, nor should there be. Next is a legal block to an opponent in bounds that continues out of bounds. Fair warning for this explanation. This idea was taken out of the rules, but it was not replaced with contradictory information. So I've still taken it as a matter of impact, similar to the idea of relative position. Relative position was also removed from the rules, but it doesn't mean you can't backblot an opponent to get your jammer through a wall. The illegal action is there. The impact is a teammate taking advantage of it. There's just no need to enumerate every single instance of it anymore. So in this case, you have a legal block inbounds a continued legal block is the opponent is moved off the track into a straddling position and then fully off the track. Once that opponent is fully out of bounds, now we're in illegal territory, although traditionally that block has been allowed to continue on two conditions. First, that the block ends before or as the initiating blocker goes either out of bounds or straddles. Or second, the block is disengaged. In the case of number one, that means the initiator of the block is still fully in bounds. You could argue that the initiator should be aware of where the opponent is to disengage. I prefer to think that the distance between the blocker and the block E is small enough so the distance that anything that comes from that, even if the block E falls, is still no impact. And unlike the example I made earlier where a skater wasn't prepared for an out of bounds block, since this is an existing block that went out of bounds, the receiving skater isn't going to immediately get out of the derby position as soon as both skates clear the boundary line. With number two, we're talking about one single continuous block. Not repetitive. Even bang, 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 bang. Each block is its own action in the rules with its own consequences. As far as impact goes, let's say the initiating blocker continues the block into a straddle. At this point, we'll want to judge the impact. Even though there's no position, knocking someone down is usually a pretty good indicator of impact. It's a slower method of returning to the track than if they weren't knocked down. It also requires a lot more energy to get up and return to their prior speed. But even if not knocked down, 
you can use the context of the game to guide your judgment. Did it cause the skater to lose control? Go to the outer edge of the safety lane. Take up enough time that it would have prevented a block or assist should the illegal action not have happened. If any of these happen, you may well have enough impact for a penalty. If both feet of the initiating blocker goes out of bounds, that level of impact for a penalty, speaking for myself, drops quite a bit. Mostly because now we're talking about a block that's moved two to three feet or more into the safety lane. Even if it doesn't send the opponent down, it has already forced that skater halfway or more into the safety lane, assuming it's a 10-footer. Let's take a few moments and break down and analyze a sequence from legal, which we have right here, to illegal and then judge the impact. The first picture is pretty much legal. The white pivot is the initiator, and the bulk of the force is coming from her torso and left leg. There might be some concern about where the leg is impacting the jammer, judging by the jammer's knee pads, but it isn't anything that we can determine from this vantage point. The second photo moves us towards the inside boundary, but is still about a foot or so away. Again, nothing here is illegal. If you're worried about arms of the jammer, we don't have the context of force or initiation. The jammer has now hit the boundary line. Once she crosses it, the jammer can no longer legally counter block, but before we'd penalize, we'd be looking for some impact beyond just the effort, which wouldn't be much as the jammer is pretty much in the pivot's control. Now that the pivot has crossed the boundary line, technically this is now illegal. But consider that we're talking about a single engagement and are only a few inches at most over the line. Any illegal impact at this point is negligible. Now the gray area has become darker. The pivot is still controlling the jammer, who is fully out of bounds. The pivot is straddling, but stretched out pretty far and covering a fair amount of space on the infield. On the other hand, short of a superhuman effort, she is going to go down on the track herself. There's no way to remove herself from this position now that she's in it. In this final slide, the pivot is fully out of bounds. Enough so that the inside pack ref is going to have to avoid both skaters and she's still physically impeding the jammer. What we don't know is how quickly the sequence took place, if the pivot disengaged and just fell in front of the jammer, or if it was a calculated move. Items like skill level, speed, distance from opposing skaters, or the edge of the engagement zone, and prior engagements during the game can all play a part in your decision on if this is enough impact to warrant a penalty or not. The rules don't change if there is only one blocker on the track for one team, but the situations do. Single blockers on the track have the potential to create a lot of confusion for both teams, so it's really important that the referees remain calm and are aware that there's only one blocker for that team, or maybe even both teams. Communicating that there's a single blocker is not just important so you don't actually send the only blocker of a team off the track, although that should be enough of a reason right there, but also to help judge things like legal and illegal no packs, destructions, and failures to reform. The no packs and failures to reform are covered in the out of play penalties program on RefEd. For the here and now, we'll continue to focus on blocks and the act of blocking. As mentioned earlier, there's no changes in the rules if there's a single blocker for one team. That means if the blocker is blocked out of bounds, you have a no-pack situation. But because the no-pack was caused by a legal block, there's no destruction penalty that should be issued. Likewise, should that single blocker make an attempt to block and fail, setting themselves down or out of bounds, there's also no penalty. With one big caveat. It must be an actual attempt to block. I've seen people 
quote, block and cause the pack to destroy for their own benefit. Keep an eye out for players being cynical and purposefully missing their blocks in order to free up their jammer because a successful block would most likely keep them in bounds. A bit more commentary on that part. Having come from a sport that has a well-known and, frankly, accurate reputation for diving, meaning soccer, or for football, everyone outside of North America, picking up a dive is awfully difficult. When I would book someone for diving in soccer, it was usually not their first attempt. It was their second or third or maybe more. First, my suspicions got up, but it still took a couple of close looks to actually verify the dive was happening. Sometimes I'd get lucky and I'd see air when someone would dive and then almost immediately look for a penalty call. But since we don't have a penalty area in Derby, honestly, I'd say it's perfectly okay and normal to take a few tries before seeing the actual event. Be sure to share your suspicions with the other refs. They may have different angles or be able to back you up. But we also want to share it so we don't see the same kind of shenanigans in derby that we see in football. Let's shift the direction and have the scenario be a blocker who's already out of bounds blocking. Typically, this is from a skater who has been knocked out of bounds and are trying to return as closely as possible to where they exited the track. I'm also going to say typically this is a blocker and not a jammer, though I've seen this too, mostly because a blocker penalty doesn't change the momentum of a game the way a jammer penalty does. And because opposing blockers don't typically try to force a cut and run back the same way they do for jammers. Although, at least at the time of this recording, I am seeing an increased trend of teams making this attempt, so don't make assumptions. From a legality standpoint, it is perfectly legal for an inbounds blocker to block the way for an out-of-bounds opponent to re-enter. The only real exception to this is during a no pack, when the requirement is to reform the pack as quickly as possible, and actively blocking the path of an out-of-bounds skater doesn't count as reformation. This isn't a call you see all the time, mostly because it's usually no to little impact. If we look at a blocker who is just blocked out of bounds and attempts to return, they typically try to do it right behind the person who knocked them out. Maybe they've got a teammate right behind, so if they force themselves in, they're impacting their teammate, not an opponent, and so there's no impact. Returning in front of that opponent is obviously a cut, but if there's no cut and the skater tried to force themselves onto the track through a different opponent, then we're, again, we're looking at impact in the wider spectrum. How did that block coming from out of bounds impact that opponent who was in a legal position? Did it change their focus? Were they in a formation that's now disrupted? Or was the new inbounds position strategically better than it was before being knocked out of bounds? Maybe looking into the the strategic reason for why the blocker was knocked out of bounds in the first place might show the impact of the skater returning. It's all a judgment call. And with those judgment calls, be ready to explain why you judged the impact high enough for a penalty. I'm going to wrap up this section by asking you to remember this once in a blue moon call. I see it once or twice a year the out-of-bounds assist. Typically, this is a whip or an assist that happens when a skater is straddling, although it certainly could be done when either the assister or assistee is fully out-of-bounds. Again, all legal actions done while out-of-bounds or straddling are technically no-nos. Judge the impact by the advantage gained by the person who received the assist. If it's just a push in the back, and the next skater is five feet away, and it's probably insufficient for a penalty. If it causes that skater to pass someone else, then we probably have reason to blow the whistle. Let's move from blocking to skating out of bounds. Even though the rules committee says, and I agree with them, 
that you shouldn't have to know the old rules to understand the current rules, I think it still does help to provide some context. How the rule evolved might, in this case, might keep you from overcalling it. The old rules said that it was illegal to skate out of bounds. Roller derby was played on the track and that exiting the track except for a penalty, injury, or avoiding a down skater was illegal. But because we roughed under the idea that anything in the rules was cut and dried, with no room for exceptions or interpretations, we called a ton of people for skating out of bounds. If someone thought they were going to cut the track and instead exit it, we would call them on skating out of bounds instead of cutting. So we added mountains of exceptions and limited the situations where the penalty should be called. Now, if that sounds dumb, well, yeah, I think it was. And that's why the rules were rewritten. Anyway, so after those exceptions were built into the rule, the end result was this. Skating out of bounds to avoid a block is a penalty. The new rule itself is a little more succinct. It is illegal to adopt or maintain a position in which one cannot be blocked. So what is our process as referees? The question is not, did the skater become unblockable? If the skater thinks there's a possible cut and exits the track to seat it, then that skater is clearly unblockable until they return to the track. Instead, the question is, was the action done to make the skater unblockable? In this example, no. The action was to see a cut, not to make themselves unblockable. Even if there was in fact no possible cut, then there should be no penalty for skating out of bounds. Even though the assumption about cutting was incorrect, the action was still an attempt to stay legal and continue playing roller derby. The same applies to a jammer calling off a jam. If the four whistles to call off a jam have started but not completed, there's no impact if a skater exits the track. I very unscientifically timed my four whistle call off and the first four whistles took three quarters of a second to complete. There's not much of an impact if a skater decides to remain on the track for that final quarter second or goes off the track. Before the first whistle, then yes, a penalty, but once it starts, let it go. One of the phrases I've used a bit when describing how to judge certain rules is by determining how cynical the action was. This is a penalty designed to combat people playing cynically. It's roller derby. Hits are part and parcel of the game, and you should be ready to get hit. Someone trying to hold a turn and failing shouldn't be called for skating out of bounds. That action was not cynical. And while you could say that someone skating out of bounds on the second or third whistle of a call off is cynical, it's not cynical enough. Skating out of bounds to avoid a hit or to force another skater to withdraw their hit is cynical. And that's pretty much what we're looking for with this penalty. Cynical play. Play designed to avoid playing roller derby. One of the new rules added in 2017 was a requirement for skaters who are out of bounds to return. Again, historically speaking, there were players and teams who, after being hit out of bounds, would stay there because they're coming back onto the track would disadvantage their team. As far as today goes, standing out of bounds isn't playing roller derby, and they are now required to return, with a few caveats. The first caveat is that skaters are still not required to skate clockwise. If a player is knocked out of bounds and another skater legally goes backwards to force them to return further than behind where they already are, they do not have to go backwards. If there's a no pack, then it's the responsibility of the skaters on the track to reform the pack. The out of bounds skater's responsibility is to re enter the track as soon as legally required, and that requirement does not include skating clockwise. The second caveat is that the referees must issue a warning before issuing a penalty. 
I've been treating this exactly like it was an out of play warning. Once the skater can re-enter, and if not already doing so, I issue the warning, and then a penalty after a beat if there was no action. By beat, I mean the amount of time it takes for a reasonable skater at whatever level of play we're on to process and at least start to comply with that order. Finally, I alluded to this a bit when talking about blocks to an out-of-bounds skater, but obviously this is roller derby. Bodies go flying. If someone is legally blocked into an out-of-bounds skater, taking them out, there shouldn't be a penalty. Likewise, if someone is legally blocked into an out-of-bounds referee, there shouldn't be an expulsion. Minor contact or brushing is not expulsion-worthy. Even major contact, if there was an attempt to avoid it, I'm thinking both the skater and referee both decide to go to the outside and then collide, it shouldn't be grounds for an expulsion. However, and I know there are lots and lots of opinions on this, so if you want to file this away as just my opinion, that's fine. But skaters are responsible for their positioning on the track. If a skater is knocked out of bounds on the inside at turn one, turns clockwise to re-enter at turn four, and hits the jammer referee forcibly, then it is the responsibility of the skater. Particularly when it comes to the inside, things are crowded. In addition to four referees, there are three or more NSOs in that narrow space. If you've looked at the positioning modules on RefEd, you'll know that there's a system in place to keep referees from tripping over each other or worse. If the skaters don't use that system, they're potentially endangering the officials inside. In captain's meetings, I frequently get requests from skaters that outside pack referees point which direction they want skaters to go from when they're coming or going from the penalty box. That's cool. It shows that they want to avoid a collision. Always a nice thing. And it's more or less become a bit of a standard, at least for the games I do, from lower level up to the playoffs. But I always remind skaters that if the OPR isn't pointing a direction, chances are they don't know you're there. This part is definitely editorializing a bit. A common argument I hear about toning down this rule is that similar issues don't warrant the same penalty in other sports. I disagree. First, unscientifically speaking, there doesn't seem to be the same problem in other sports that Derby has with officials getting seriously injured. I've still refed soccer longer than I've refed Derby, and the number of injuries from other referees in soccer due to collisions with players and keep in mind, I know far more refs in soccer and could do 100 games in three months. Those injured refs was zero. I've known a whole bunch of concussed refs in Derby. Some missing months of work. Some permanently retired because of it. I don't know as many hockey and American football referees, but the only time I see video of them being injured is if there's an intentional assault, not an accidental takeout. Skaters I know who started as refs for multiple years get it. Referees skate differently from players. Skaters skate low for stability. Refs skate higher for visibility and speed. The reaction, if there's a hard hit between the two, is dramatic. I wanted to take a few minutes to wrap this up. I decided to make this video a little longer by combining a few related topics. As the new rules have compressed the types of calls, it seemed to make sense to try to group these related topics together. Did it work for you? Did it not? Let me know for future videos. I would like to thank both Jules Doyle and Matthew Marty Fraley for permission to use their photographs in this presentation. I'd like to thank the Vienna Roller Derby for their permission to use their Ultimate Roller Derby Ubiquitous Magnet Board for this presentation. It can be found at viennarollerderby.org slash urdumb. This video is part of a series of videos on how to referee roller derby 
on refed.com. If you just found this video on YouTube, you might want to make your way over to refed.com to look at some of the other resources, such as links to other videos arranged by the rule for easy searching, written articles, opinion pieces, clinic locations, and more. As always, if you like this video or the other content on refed.com, please share it and share this site. This presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.